Uh, my name is Barkley, and I have been interested in radio since, oh, I don't know, about 1956 when I built my first crystal set with a, a razor blade and a piece of pencil lead. So uh, that's 50 years or more, but uh, I'm losing count. Anyway, um, I knew that the uh, one of the themes for uh, this conference would be midget radios. And I was always kind of interested in the fact that midget radios are small and spy radios are small. So I wondered uh, what, if any, connections there might be. So I did a little bit of exploration in this, uh, in this area. So um, what I'd like to do first is uh, go ahead and take a look at a midget radio. Uh, this is a Silvertone Peewee 1939. Uh, I've tried to uh, provide uh, sources for this sort of thing. But if you go up on the internet and just do midget radio, all of, all of this stuff will appear. But what, what's interesting from the present perspective about this radio is the second band. Um, it not only has the broadcast band, but it has the police band. And in this particular radio, it goes up from 1.8 to about 4.9. Now, you may recall or have learned that um, Actually, well into the 1950s, there were many police stations just above the AM broadcast band. Uh, and I, I used to listen to them when I was a little kid once in a while. So uh, there was a police band there that uh, later got moved up to VHF, initially up to the 30 to 50 megahertz range. But <clears throat> these radios could be, could be used to listen to uh, your local uh, police station. And uh, usually the, uh, what was happening was one-way broadcast to uh, police cars. This is in the days pretty much before the police cars had radios to transmit back, but they were one-way broadcasts, you know. Uh, you know, big guy with glasses and no hair has just robbed the bank and is going east on Main Street. <laughs> that sort of thing, so you gotta watch out. <laughs> so uh, this was this is a very small radio. So as you can see, you, I'm sure you know midgets. I mean, this isn't more than seven or eight inches uh, across. All right. So these are the interesting elements about this from the, you know, think about going to the police bands and the spies band. And we're talking pretty much operations in Europe, uh, not in the Pacific. And you gotta remember, the uh, first time I found myself staggering around Europe, everything is really pretty close together. You know, France is right next to Belgium and, and uh, you know, Germany and, and uh, Spain and all these very interesting things. It's really not very far away. So you're not talking about thousands of miles, you're talking about hundreds of miles. Now, <clears throat> the police band on this particular radio is 1.8 to 4.9 megahertz. Well, that's actually, think about it as amateur radio, either 160 meters up to uh, 80 meters, or 75 meters. But this is actually uh, a pretty good frequency range for relatively short distance ionospheric skip. And those of you who are, who are operators on 80 meters, will we'll recognize this. This is, uh, this is a useful band uh, if there are um, ionospheric conditions that permit uh, skip. And usually, at, in these frequencies, no matter what, there will, be, there will be skip at night. So if you're in England, this covers most of Western Europe. So in a sense, even before World War II, because the Peewees had to be designed in 37, 38, uh, manufactured 39, that sort of thing. Uh, there's a miniaturized receiver technology that could enable uh, clandestine operation. And the clandestine operation has two aspects. One, of course, is receiving, which can be very important and actually still is, and the other is transmitting. Uh, we have the next slide. Now, this is, this is what the Pee Wee looks like. It's kind of beat up, but it's a very, very compact construction. Uh, a couple of metal tubes, a couple of glass tubes, and incidentally, this is a, this is a TRF. Now, from the a point of view of clandestine operations, um, of the available circuits, there are really three that we'd be talking about. Maybe, maybe one would be an entirely passive receiver, crystal set, uh, but you wouldn't necessarily be able to operate it very well on uh, short wave frequencies, and you're looking at a very long antenna too, which can be something of a telltale. But um, the other the other two, the three available circuits would be the tuned radio frequency circuits, the super heterodyne circuits, and the regenerative circuit. Well, the regenerative circuit has a terrible problem. It goes into regeneration. 
And when it goes into regeneration, of course, it is sending out a signal. So if you're trying uh, to listen very quietly and not be detected by people who will you know, beat you close to death and then murder you, uh, you don't want to be sending out a signal. Uh, so the regenerative circuits are very, very dangerous for clandestine operation. Well, okay, so we'll use superheads. Well, not so fast, because the superhead has got a local oscillator in it, as you know. Those local oscillators also radiate. And uh, Scott, uh, in the Second World War, convinced the Navy that it should buy the so-called SLR, the Scott Low Radiation Receiver, for use on ships, which weighs a ton because it's completely copper clad to make sure that no radiation gets out of the local oscillator. Because he, he uh, based on you know, it's one anecdotal instance in the, in the First World War of a submarine being tracked down because of an oscillation in a radio. Um, he convinced the Navy that it should protect all of its uh, radios from this, uh, at least in, in this kind of operation, from uh, any emission from the local oscillator. So that was a Scott SLR. If you ever see him, it's a, it's a big old radio. It's a beautiful radio, but it really does weigh a ton because of the copper. So um, the superheader dean has definite disadvantages in clandestine operations as well. And in fact, if you look at uh, Peter Wright's book, Spy Catcher, he talks about how MI5 used to isolate the circuits that Moscow was using to talk to spies in England by knowing where the, where, roughly where the spies were and listening to the local oscillator for oscillations determining, you hear the local oscillator, you had 455 kilohertz, and you would hear you would know what frequency the spy was listening to, so you would ever, you would be able to link up the circuit coming out of the coming out of Russia with the spy in England. It's a very interesting uh, technique that was used. So the TRF, which was the, which was actually what these many of these peewees in uh, uh, midgets use, the TRF circuit is the ideal circuit for clandestine operations because it doesn't radiate. And that's very very important, particularly if you're the guy operating. Here's another beautiful little peewee. Uh, same situation, very nice design. Next. Uh, and again, here's a nice Detrola. Um, now, this actually, this is not the policeman, but this is a, a, a metric in meters. And here's a metric in kilocycles. So this is what the back of the Detroler chassis looks like. And so we've got all metal tubes here. And this will be a uh, circuit that was uh, in use. This is actually the so-called pogo stick radio. So it's a signal core radio, it's a 511, um, designed in 1937 or so, in operation by 1940. Now it was, it was actually designed for uh, cavalry. Now cavalry had a big problem in, in uh, both the First and Second World War, it was called a machine gun. And so you didn't actually see a lot of cavalry operations, although there was a cavalry charge in the Philippines. Uh, at the beginning of the Second World War. It was actually a, an effective cavalry charge in the Philippines against the Japanese invasion. I mean, relatively effective. Um, but as you can see, uh, this actually had infantry use. So this is a, a little uh, speaker battery pack, and this is the microphone, so you lean down into the microphone. Now, uh, this is convenient to hold in your hand this way, but the, the, the actual design reason is so that the radio operator could be sitting on a horse and could drop that bottom spike pole into a holster. And then the, the radio itself would be about at chest height, and then the antenna would be above him. So this is for tactical communications in the, uh, in the cavalry. But it, it ended up being used in the infantry. Um, and it's, it's not very different from the, from the uh, handy talking, which is, you know, you've seen the BC-611, the little uh, World War II handy talking in terms of the circuit. It's, it's uh, essentially a, minor, a minor miniaturization, and it had the miniature civilian tubes in it. And here's another picture uh, of in, uh, in, in maneuvers, and this is the way it would be used. And, and so, you know, the lieutenant would say something to this guy, and this guy would say something to somebody else, and it would go back and forth. Now, these didn't have very much power, but this is the circuit. So this is a transceiver circuit. Uh, and the, the output was about three quarters of a watt out. Now, 
from the point of view of linking up with spies in foreign countries, even if they're only across the English Channel, that's not enough power, obviously. But on the other hand, it's not that hard to amplify a radio frequency signal. Uh, so this has the, the makings of, uh, of a spy radio, the beginning makings of a spy radio. And this is a superhead circuit, which as I said, has a downside for sure. Um, but you can see that the actual receiver that we were looking at, we go back one, is, uh, is very, very small. And if you look in it, you'll see it's got, it's got you know, seven, seven tubes in it. And it's extremely compact. And that's very, very useful, of course, in spy radios. You want little radios and not big radios for obvious reasons. All right, next. And next. Now, uh, here's one I had never seen before. And it's from an Italian site, Radio Militari. Um, and it is uh, a Czech 1935 spy set. This is not a transceiver. But it's, as many of these radios will be, it is a transmitter and a receiver in separate boxes. Although, just about the right size to fit into a suitcase, so you could carry it around. Now, if it's a little heavier, you're going to look like you're carrying something a little heavier than your suit. <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, you could carry it around. From what I can tell from the images here, this is uh, an extraordinarily well-built uh, piece of kit. And as you'll see in a minute, there's actually a power tube in here. Now, this is the receiver itself. Um, put together very well, uh, seals up, it's, uh, it's, it's really good gear. And this is the, uh, it's the power tube uh, on the back. So so in comparison with the, the SCR 511, it's putting out three quarters of a watt. This is probably putting out somewhere between five and 15 watts. And that's about what you need at a minimum to uh, to get around even with, with ionospheric skip. Now, remember, the if, if you're a spy in operation in, in occupied France, for example, and you're putting out 5 or 15 watts, remember the, the English have extraordinarily huge antennas pointing at you. They select which antenna. They've got rhombic antennas. They've got all sorts of stuff up. They have extraordinarily sensitive receivers. So on the receiving end, they can make up for your lack of power. You don't have to be putting out hundreds of watts. You can put out 10 watts because the receivers are so sensitive because the antennas are so good. And they really did have fields of rhombic antennas to keep in touch with people in occupied Europe. Now, this is the other side of the story. Uh, this, is a, this is a German spy radio. Um, basically the same idea. It fits in a briefcase. This is the antenna. Um, these are batteries, I believe. And this was, uh, this was captured in Scotland. Now, um, I, I don't have any reason to think that this came from the, the German uh, general who flew to Scotland supposedly to, to make peace in 1939 or whatever it was. Say again? Rudolf. Rudolf Hess, yes, right. I have no reason to, to believe that there's any connection here, but on the other hand, he did fly to Scotland and maybe he had this in his plane. I just don't know. That's complete and utter speculation on my part. But Scotland, again, Scotland isn't that far from Germany. <laughs> Get right down to it. It's not that hard to fly from Germany to Scotland. And so um, this one is reported to have been captured in Scotland at the very beginning of the war. Now, this is a, an Italian set, uh, again, in a suitcase or a little briefcase. Now, this is very interesting because this was made in Italy by the Geloso Company. Now, Geloso, I think his name was Anthony Geloso. I'm not sure of that, but he had been an engineer here in the United States for, I think, helicopters. He was a first-class engineer, no question about it. And some of you may have seen some post-World War II gear that he put together, the Geloso receiver and transmitter. And they are just absolutely gorgeous They're, from a design point of view and from a performance point of view. They're wonderful, wonderful uh, pieces of gear, comparable to the best of Hallicrafters. And maybe he was one of the best of the Hallicrafters engineers, I don't know. It's, it's, I don't exactly remember the company he was with, but it was it either Hallicrafters or National. And I think it was the Hallicrafters. So anyway, which also went back to Italy before the war and uh, started working in electronics uh, uh, for Italy in the Geloso company, and he built uh, this particular Italian spy receiver, which had an excellent reputation in the field. 
And this, this is what it looks like. Uh, you know, this is a pretty standard metal chassis, and, and we're talking about uh, metal tubes, uh, and we got a power tube here. And uh, this is the under underside. Um, so that site, uh, radiomilitary.com, is an excellent site for this sort of thing. All right, now here, this is a this is a Russian suitcase spy radio from World War II, and. Uh, it was it was on the cover of the Norwegian uh, amateur radio magazine fairly recently, 2009. Uh, but what's so interesting, it was made to look like it had been manufactured in the United States. So there's a certain amount of disinformation going on at the same time. So this, you know, if you ran into this, gosh, it looked like we had an American spy here in Norway. I don't know exactly why we'd have an American spy in Norway, but anyway. Uh, so this, so it, it, this this in, a, in, in, the, in the spy business, this is known as a false flag operation. Uh, refugees in England. Um, now the, the Poles, you know, got caught between the Russians and the Germans, of course. Uh, but uh, they were technologically highly advanced, and many of you know the story of the Polish mathematicians who did the original work on decrypting the Enigma transmissions, and they were the foundation for what the British did uh, at Fletchley Park. And the Poles also put these uh, radios together, uh, and they were. Very, very good uh, radios. As you can see, it's very compact. Um, and these were actually used by the British Secret Service. The, the Poles designed them, and then they were built and used by the British Secret Service, which would have been MI6. And then some other, these, are, these are images from the British uh, Vintage Wireless Society. Now here again, this is, this is uh, a couple of, uh, a couple of, this is a, a different radio, I believe, but this is what it looks like in the suitcase. So you could carry this around, you know, it, it looked like a, you could look like a businessman and uh, not be particularly suspicious looking. Now let's talk a little bit about what we mean in terms of spy radios. There's a difference between what, uh, say, the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, or the British SOE, which is the uh, Special Operations Executive, what they were doing and what MI6 or the military intelligence, uh, secret uh, intelligence service, uh, or you know, our, the CIA to some extent later, what they were doing. The operations guys, the OSS and the SOE, they're out blowing things up and killing people. That's their job. Sometimes it's you know, to prepare for the invasion, sometimes it's just harassment, but that's what they did throughout the Second World War in Europe. The spies, on the other hand, the last thing that they want is somebody in the neighborhood blowing things up. They want everything to be very, very quiet and very, very unremarkable. They don't want people blowing things up and they don't want people killing people. And the people who are running the spies are always in conflict with the people who are running the operations. Because the operations, you know, we want to blow up the railroad station, we want to blow up the bridge. Wait a minute, we've got a guy who's observing the trains and is giving us phenomenal information on what's going to the Eastern Front, and if you blow up the bridge, they're going to get him. It's, you know, it's just not going to work that way. So there's this tension going on between uh, the actual spies, if you're using some of these radios, and the, the saboteur types, the operational types, who are also using some of these radios. Uh, and it's, it's an unresolved tension. And it is, to this day, it's an unresolved tension. And the problem is that the covert actions can undercut intelligence gathering. And so it becomes a policy balance between the value of the intelligence and the value of the covert actions. And it's a very difficult balance to, to, uh, to work. Now here's a, here's a very, very famous uh, SOE radio, uh, which is the so-called Paraset. Uh, it's very compact. You could obviously put this in a suitcase. It's a, trans, it's a transceiver. Um, it's, a, it's a splendid little box. And there are a few of these around. But there are now people who are, who are building these from scratch. So there are replica parasets that are used on the amateur radio bands. Uh, and I'm sure it's great fun to, to uh, you know, build a, a 1942 paraset and get it up on 80 meters and talk to your friends in Germany with it. Uh, now this is, this is the, a real classic. Uh, this is the uh, Special Operations Executive, SOE, 
and um, this is the type three make two. And this is a this is the tuning coil. This is the meter, of course. It doesn't really show too well here. Um, I'll have to do something about the contrast. But anyway, uh, this is the the nameplate on it, and this was the crystal. Uh, so it's crystal controlled operation. Uh, this is a cover photo on the, the BBWS year 2000 uh, uh, magazine, and uh, it's a little clearer in the photo, so I'll work on that. But this this is the classic one. Uh, this this can still be. These are still around, not many of them, but, but there are some. There are still there are still some around. Again, this is this is the same uh, uh, type three make two, and you can get a little bit uh, better idea. What it, here's where the coil would go right here, um, and you can. This is a, in the suitcase configuration. Now, as I said, this is the special operations executive, and what Churchill said to them was, "Set Europe ablaze." And that's, you know, that's great from an operational point of view, but very annoying to the spies. All right, here's a nice, here's a, a better, better color picture. Uh, so this, it's in, it's, it's in a wooden box, it's not a suitcase, but it's in a wooden box. And um, you can see, again, this is where the coils go up here, your meter, tuning, um, and uh, your crystal would go here. So this is uh, one of the better uh, photos of this particular set. Now here, here's one that I was unaware of, um, but I'll tell you in England there was a set called the MCR, which stood for Modular Clandestine Receiver. Uh, is Alan Carter here by any chance? Yeah. Oh well, Alan's got one. So if you want to crawl on your knees up his steps in Croydon, he may even show it to you. It's it's one of the most wonderful little modular receivers that you can imagine. But the Germans had one too. And, and that's interesting because this may be what they talk about in evolution is convergence, where you know people sort of, uh, you know, animals sort of start looking like each other if they do roughly the same sort of thing. Uh, or it may be a matter of copying. I'm sure many of you have seen the Gibson Girl lifeboat transmitter. So it's a kind of yellow box, and you'd sit there, you squeeze the thing together with your knees, you'd strap it, you'd crank it, and it would put out an SOS on 500 kilohertz. And uh, there may be one in the, in the museum. I don't know. Ed, Ed, is it, Ed, does the museum have a Gibson girl? Yeah, yeah. All right, well, it turns out that the Gibson girl was copied directly from the German equivalent because during the, the early days of the Battle of Britain, the German planes would go down and the guy would be in his life raft and be cranking away, waiting, waiting for the Luftwaffe to come rescue him. And the, and the British would get him and say, hey, this is a really neat radio. Why don't we make these? And so they did. And so that's why there's Gibson girls, uh, because we copied it from the Germans. Now, I don't know, I have no information whatsoever, whether the MCR was copied from the Germans or whether the Germans copied the MCR. Because once you've captured one of these things, hey, that's a great idea, let's do it. And so that's, you know, it could easily have happened that way. Or it could have been, as I said, convergence. It's sort of the thing that would, you, would naturally evolve on both sides of the Second World War to get smaller and smaller, more effective uh, radios. Uh, and this is, this is from a collection that's also on the internet, LA6NCA, so you can uh, just check it out. Uh, this, is, this is the transmitter module. Uh, here's the key. So can we go back one? Yeah, here's the key. So what we're looking at in terms of dials and, and whatnot are on the back side, so you can't see them from here, but here's the key. All right, let's go forward. Yeah, so here's the dials and whatnot for the transmitter. All right, let's go. And here is the, uh, here's the inside. So now again, notice what we have here is we have these nice metal tubes. Now these are German metal tubes, and they're kind of more compact. Um, but they certainly have a lot of advantages in terms of, uh, well, they don't break. <laughs> well, I suppose they break, but not nearly as easily as glass tubes. So they're more solid, they're more reliable throughout. Now here's the uh, under chassis of the, uh, of the receiver. Now here's, um, this, been, this now has been restored by this fellow, and he's got a new power tube in it. And, uh, and this is the answer to how you get from 3 quarters of a watt to 8 to 10 watts. You need a power tube, just like we saw in the check radio. So you need a power tube. Once you've got the power tube, you've got the 8 or 10 watts that you need. 
And you don't really need much more than that, given the sensitivity of the receivers and the, and the effectiveness of the antennas that you hope will be listening to you. Now, here's the U.S. Uh, workhorse covert action set. This is the OSS set, and uh, the nomenclature is SSTR1. Uh, incidentally, there's a fellow by the name of Gary Kane. Uh, I don't know, Gary, are you here today by any chance? No. Well, uh, Gary got a hold of the 16 millimeter training film for the SSTR-1 and put it on video. And I suspect it's still available from him. So if you're, if you're really interested in this radio, the, tra the training film is available. Uh, now, this is the receiver over here. And this is the transmitter, and it's a crystal, and there's, and there's the power supply. Now, um, if you wanted longer range, there was a power amplifier, SST-103, which had an 815 tube in it, which could get you out at, you know, maybe 25 or 30 or 40 watts or something like that. But again, you know, there's a downside to using too much power if you're out in the field. It makes it much easier for direction finders to work on you, and it makes it much easier to get triangulated and then strangulated <laughs> because they'll catch you. And so, you know, the, the use of a lot of power is not necessarily a good idea. But on the other hand, if you say, you know, in a jungle in Burma, uh, yeah, you've got that problem, but you also have to get out. And you're, you're not talking necessarily 150 miles anymore. You may be talking five, six, seven, eight hundred miles or more, or maybe even back to India. And so, there certainly were instances when higher power was, was entirely appropriate uh, in these sets. Um, now, this, this is an interesting radio because the, the company that um, did it was so busy with other projects that they said they couldn't do it. But there was an RCA engineer, I think his name was Hurd, H-U-R-D, who um, worked for the company and it was at, at that point was a major in the signal corps. And he said, look, I'll do it at home. And he did. So he designed the entire thing at home at night and uh, put it together uh, and basically brought it in ready to be built. And that's how it, that's how it came about. Uh, now, we'll get to this, but this is, this is from Peter McCollum's site. Now, this is a, 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 more, a somewhat more advanced, although curiously enough, uh, earlier in design. Um, and so this is the, the OSS AN PRC-5. And I think PRC stands for something like personal radio. I don't remember exactly that nomenclature. Maybe somebody can help me out on that. But the, the, there was a PRC-1 and, um, and a PRC-4 and a PRC-5. Now, um, as you, this, is, this is in a little suitcase, briefcase configuration. And again, you know, we've got the meter, we've got the coil. Here's a signal case, signal core stamp on it. But I had, I had thought incorrectly that this was, you know, designed about 1943 and put into, uh, put into the field about 1944, uh, and I was wrong. It turns out that this radio was actually designed for the Forest Service in 1937. This was a little radio to go out in the woods with. Uh, and it got converted to um, uh, military use, uh, to spy use, and, and uh, covert action use, but it's, it's a very handsome a very handsome set, uh, and there are a few of these around around also. There, there was another uh, there was another one which I think was the and PRC uh, PRC four it might have been, but anyway they 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 didn't get built by the end of the Second World War, but there were a lot of they were ready to get built, and so they were sold as kits. And sometimes if you look in the ads in 1946 1947. You'll see ads for the so-called Lucy receiver, and it's a kit that you could build. And what happened is somebody bought the stock from the company, the the parts and, and everything, and you could buy this thing and build your own spy receiver. So if you see if you see one of those Lucy radios around, it was actually going to be the uh, advanced generation World War II spy receiver. It just never uh, the war ended too soon for it to be put into production. Uh, I've never actually seen one of those Lucy kits, but. It certainly would be an interesting thing to take a look at. Yeah, here, here it is in its uh, little uh, secret clandestine case. Uh, convenient schematic here in case you want to <laughs> work on it. 
<laughs> I think a lot of the guys in the field, even though they were radio operators, but amateur radio operators themselves and were trained radio operators, weren't necessarily uh, technically adept. But on the other hand, this is the kind of situation where you had every, every incentive in the world to maximize your technical adeptness because, you know, this thing could save your life if need be. So this is, this is the way they actually put it in the field, as far as I can tell. It actually had the schematic diagram on it. And this is not that different from the uh, horsey talkie that we were looking at, the SCR 511. If you actually look at the circuit, it's the same kind of transceiver circuit, uh, although a little bit more power. Now, if you get interested in this, go, go to uh, www.militaryradio.com slash spy radio. And this is Peter McCollum's site, and that's his email. Um, and most of the images I've just shown you come off of that site, all the various people send him things at various times. Uh, and this is probably the, well, to my mind, one of the most interesting uh, uh, radio sites. There's also an English site called Army Radio, which has a nice essay by um, uh, retired uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, about spy radio. So if you just, uh, just go to Google spy radios, all of the sites are there, and they're very, very interesting sites. Now, here, here's the what the CIA essentially put together after the Second World War, and it was called the RS-1. It was also uh, designed for special forces use. Um, it, but this was particularly in the 1950s. Uh, we'll go through this a little bit, but in any event, uh, you know, there's the, the receiver, the transmitter, and the power supply. So the standard configuration is very small, it fits in a suitcase or a little box, and you can do a number of things with it. You can carry it around in a canvas bag, or you can put it in the equivalent of watertight ammo cans and bury it, and we'll get back to that. So here's the transmitter. This is from uh, our friend Dennis Monticelli collection. And uh, you, this, so there's your tuning chart. And it's pretty basic spy radio stuff here. Uh, all right, so next. And here's the power tube again. So here's the inside. So again, this is putting out somewhere between 8 and 15 watts. And this is the underside. Again, the transmitter. And uh, again, this is the inside from the other angle. Now here's the receiver, RR2B. Um, and it's... You know, you'll see it's, it's, it's as small as it can be at the time for um, late 1940s, early 1950s operation. Uh, here's the crystal, by the way. Now, if, if, uh, if you look into this year's uh, AWA review, I've got an article on the Swan Island, the CIA on the Swan Island and that sort of thing. But I've also put a little appendix together that, that have some of these photos of the RS-1 because this was the radio in 1954 that the CIA gave to the so-called Guatemalan insurgents who were overthrowing Colonel Arbenz at the behest of United Fruit. Although that's a long story and I urge you to read the article. But the subtitle is The uh, Revenge of United Fruit. But this was actually the radio that was put into the field by the CIA for insurgents in various places at various times. Now here, um, this is the receiver, and now we have the miniature tubes. Most of the, most of the spy radios we looked at before had the octal or equivalent tubes in them, metal octal tubes, or the equivalent, uh, in the Germ on the German side, for example. Um, but now we're back to, in a sense, back to the future. This is, this is the, these are the same kind of tubes that were used in the 1937 horsey talking. Although it's a different tube, but it's not the you know one S four things like that. But it's the same. It's the same configuration. These are the uh, pins through the glass, and that that's a highly stable, reliable configuration. The pins through the glass that you see in these miniature tubes, and so this is what the receiver is using. Um, and you can see, and I don't I don't have the circuit in mind, but you can see that these are gang capacitors. And uh, this is a super header thing, as far as I know, but it looks like it's got an RF stage on it. Um, I'll have to check and see if this is a TRF, but I think it's a super head. This is another view of the, of the receiver here. All right, so now this is the next evolution in the 1960s. Uh, this is the uh, RS6 radio. Um, we have one of these 
well, I'll get to it. It's in the California Historical Radio Society Museum. And it's a, it's a very, very interesting, very, very compact set. Uh, this is the receiver. This is the transmitter. There's a power supply, and this is sort of a power regulator. And in the California Historical Radio Society, we have these two pieces, but we don't have those two pieces. Um, but this has in it the sub-miniature tubes. So that you may, they may have first been developed uh, for hearing aid use in the late 1930s. They're very small, they're very rugged. And keep in mind that in the 1940s, one of the most important weapons that we had in the Second World War was the proximity fuse because it made it possible to shoot things down in the sky relatively easily uh, because the, the shell would get near or approximately close to an airplane and then would blow up and the airplane would fall out. Now, the proximity fuse had a little radar transmitter in it. And so the shell itself is a, a radar transmitter and receiver and as it goes nearer and nearer to the aircraft, it's getting the, the uh, reflection back and when it gets close enough, it blows up. Well, that had vacuum tubes in it. So we're talking about vacuum tubes that are literally shot out of guns uh, on these anti-aircraft guns. And each of these shells had a little radio transmitter in the tip, which was its trigger. So these vacuum tubes were extraordinarily rugged. I mean, think of the G-forces that come out of a 75 millimeter shell out of a, out of a cannon. You know, These things were very, very rugged and they had a very good reliability rate. So we're using, they weren't necessarily the same tubes, but it's the same rugged style of, of vacuum tube being used in the RS-6. Now here's, here's the receiver, a better shot of the receiver. And uh, this is this particular one, this is now in the, at the CHRS Museum, and, and uh, Denny Monticelli restored it for us. But this particular receiver has got a, it's, it's a very odd sequence um, because it's got the, uh, the, the double X and whatnot. No, it, we don't actually know a lot about what happened with these. But when we, we think about the RS1, which is the earlier version, and then the RS6, a lot of these were made, and there's some, there's some, we know that the RS6, for example, went into, can we go back one? Went, went into the uh, Strategic Air Command. So at least on the B-47, uh, beneath the uh, ejection seat, there was one of these radios. So the idea was that the B-47s are going to go nuke Moscow or something, but they can't get back. So the pilots were told, well, that's okay, because what you'll do is you'll eject when you run out of fuel, and then you'll land in Siberia, and you'll take your radio out, okay, and you'll tell us where you are, and we'll come get you. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is true optimism. <laughs> All right. But anyway, this is the story, that, that the way this, this, this was used in the Strategic Air Command, and they certainly were under some of these ejection seats. But there weren't that many B-47s. There was an awful lot of these radios. So they were also used by special forces. Now, special forces in the 50s and in the 60s, before Vietnam, almost exclusively focused on Europe. And the idea was that the Russians are going to sweep to the coast, and it's going to be just like the Germans and the Nazis in the Second World War, except this time we're going to be ready for them, because we're going to have special forces operations all over the place, and, and we're going to have what are called leave-behind caches. And so we're going to have things buried all over Western Europe that contain radio sets and gold coins and guns and ammunition and, you know, whatever this and, and that. And so when the Special Forces guys go back to link up with the supposed partisans, they're going to know where all this stuff is and we'll be able to dig it out of the ground and, and go to work. So uh, there's some speculation that a lot of these radios were uh, designed, were actually used as leave-behind radios. We also know that the Soviets did that in, uh, in East Germany and other places, uh, and sometimes in, in, in Western uh, countries, that they buried caches, including the equivalent of the uh, RS-1. At least one of them has been dug up and photographed. And so this was something that went on. So we don't, we don't know where all these radios ended up. Uh, an awful lot of them were used in special forces. And, uh, and some of them were then um, put into the hands of Mars operators, the military affiliated radio system, uh, and the Civil Air Patrol. Uh, and they sort of moved from there into, into some, some civilian and amateur radio uses. Now, one of the, this particular radio had, had something that was very rare. It actually had the instruction cards 
uh, with the radio. So that's what the, these, these, these cards are. And uh, at some point, I want to get these, you know, blown up and posted, uh, posted on the internet because they are, they are very rare. But you can see the configuration. There's the receiver, there's the transmitter, there's the power supply, there's the power regulator. Now, this is also a spy radio. And again, the contrast isn't so great, but this is a uh, Panasonic shortwave receiver from the mid '80s, and this was actually used by spies. Uh, unfortunately, they were spying on us. And this is the radio that was used by the, uh, the, the man and his wife in the State Department who had been Cuban spies almost from the beginning uh, in the early 1960s. Now this is not a transmitter, this is a receiver. So we go back to the, you know, you know civilian circuits. Uh, and the way this worked is that um, the Cubans, the Russians through the Cubans, would broadcast numbers that's all they are, numbers. I'm sure many of you in shortwave radios have heard the numbers broadcasts. They're still on, by the way. They're still going on. Uh, and it's, there are five, five number groups uh, out of Cuba, you know, they're, they're you know, Spanish, Atencion, Atencion, or whatever. And this is, this is a, a really effective way to communicate with people in the field because they, they're not sending anything back. They're just getting their instructions. And they have one-time pads. Now, I can't tell you the limits of what the National Security Agency can do, but I can tell you that a one-time pad is extremely difficult to decipher um, because it's, it's just every, every little page is a completely new encryption system. Now, there's, in the Second World War, the Russians were using a one-time pad system for their uh, diplomatic cables from the United States back to the, to the Soviet Union. And somebody in Russia made a mistake, and they duplicated the one-time pads. And the Army Security Agency caught that. And as a result of that duplication, they were able to break the Russian diplomatic traffic, which is known as the Venona intercepts. And it was the Russians in the United States telling the Russians back in Russia who the American spies were and what they were doing pretty much resolves the issue of whether Alger Hiss was a Russian spy or not. Uh, the Venona traffic is a fascinating uh, set of uh, messages, and there's a book called The Venona Traffic. But the, the Cubans, as far as we know, as far as I know, <laughs> never made that mistake. They didn't duplicate the one-time pads. And so the numbers broadcast are coming over, and the people are listening to them on this little radio, and now again, if, if you know that this radio is radiating from its local oscillator and you're driving around and you're listening 455 kilohertz down, assuming that that's what the IF is on this radio, or up rather, so you hear the local oscillator and you go up and sure enough what you hear on the frequency, 455 kilohertz above the local oscillator, is the Cuban numbers broadcast. Well, you've got a clue that this guy is listening to the Cuban numbers broadcast. So sometimes you only get one clue. And, uh, you know, so it would have been possible to track it down this way. So, so how, did we, how did we ultimately deal with these guys? Well, incidentally, you remember the, the 10 Russian spies that we just uh, caught and sent to Russia to get our spies back? You know, 10 for three, I thought, you know, we should, we should get some more people. But anyway, so, we, you know, we gave them back. They were also using one-time pads, and they were also using shortwave radios, just like this, just commercial shortwave radios, probably a little bit better than 1983 Panasonic, but that's what they were using. And so they were getting instructions, again, out of Cuba uh, from the Cuban uh, number system, uh, numbers transmissions. Uh, but the, the FBI dealt with that in a fairly straightforward way. They just burgled their apartments and houses <laughs> and got the, got the messages. <laughs> and then left and didn't, didn't leave any clue that they'd been there. So they basically had all the traffic. They weren't, they weren't going through any of this complicated mathematical algorithm, hypercomputer decryption stuff. They were just going in and stealing it, which is their job. Uh, so the, the one-time pad system actually still uh, is still in use. The numbers broadcasts are still in use, and there are still, as far as we know, spies that are listening on commercial 
civilian gear uh, and getting their instructions uh, from Cuba. I think the idea that this is the, the you know the last ten Russian spies is fatuous. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised at least another hundred of them out there somewhere. All right, uh, and I'm very careful never to listen to the Cuban number station on a superhead. <laughs> I don't need the heat. <laughs> Well, what have we here? Some of you may have seen The Simpsons on TV. It's actually the only TV show I've ever liked in the last 25 years. And uh, it's a great, great comedic odyssey, The Simpsons. Well, early on, well, you know, uh, Homer Simpson, my hero, Homer Simpson works in a nuclear power plant. And, uh, you know, he eats a lot of donuts and he's not paying attention to the meters. If you watch The Simpsons, you may have noticed this, all right? And I think it's Mr. Burns' power plant, if I'm not mistaken. And there's a little three-eyed fish in the, in the pond out there from the radiation and stuff like that. Well, so what happens, what hap happens here is, is Bart, my namesake, okay, he gets into some kind of mischief and he's sent to Albania as you know, sort of a punishment. But it becomes an Albanian exchange student thing. And so an Albanian student comes to live with the Simpsons. And he's very, very interested in what Homer does at the atomic power plant. And, you know, and he's a, he's a radio kid like many of us are, all right? Well, it turns out that he is a spy. <laughs> and here is his midget radio. <laughs> And he is sending back to Albania, remember this is 1990, okay? He's sending back to Albania the information about what, uh, what, Homer, uh, what Homer is doing here. All right, so that, that's, that's, uh, that's what I could figure out, the relationship between midget radios and, uh, and spy radios. So uh, if somebody in the back could hit at least one of the lights, that would be good. And uh, could somebody find a light switch back there? Yeah, any old light switch will do. Or maybe somebody knows where they are here. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, we just need one. All right, so thank you very much. You've been in a very attentive audience, and I appreciate it. I'll take any questions you want.